It's Tony from South Arctica, and you are tuned on. <sighs> Look at this music reviews.com. Stay tuned. Sitting down with Tony from San Africa. Thanks a lot for sitting down with us, man. Really so, um, yeah, man, how are you guys doing so far? How are you like in Montreal? Did you get a chance to come out? And, yeah, uh, go look around a little so bit. Far, everything's good. Um, over. we're done with the uh, beginning problems that we had, you know, with technical things, you know, but, but uh, the day's gonna be perfect. And uh, me and Posse, bass player, we went out for walking, and then it seems we have a Ferris wheel and then. You know, cable and wire, yeah. you know, sliding things and all that cool stuff happening. So yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah always weather too. That's it. Actually, it's uh, seasonally warm right now. You guys got us right in time because it was a lot colder earlier on. Yeah. But, uh, anyways, here hopefully everything's going to be a great show tonight. Now we have technical difficulties. Yeah. So uh, first things first. Uh, like, let's talk about uh, Bryce Child, uh, your last record that came out about two years ago now. Right. On your last record. So it came out in March of 2014. Um, now that it's been a couple of years and you've been playing songs live, um, you've been getting feedback from the fans and whatnot, how do you feel that the, 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 this record has resonated with your fans and how do you feel about this record now, like two years after the fact? Do you ever find yourself sort of going back and critiquing your own work, like, after the fact? No, of course you always have critics and you realize that I have done this differently or better or whatever, but, but anyway, um, I think a lot of fans think uh, about the album the same way I do, really, that it, it's a step in the right direction after a little experiment, <laughs> experimenting with the with, uh, stuff for her name. And uh, you know, we've been jumping around a lot lately, you know, but we had Reckoning Night, which was like, like in line with, with things, and then, then Unia, which was a jump on the side, and then Stone for uh, I mean, uh, The Days of Grace, that was different once again, and then Stone for her name, and now. A perished child, I feel the way that it would be continuing the first, the role of the first four album. Right. So in some way, this is our fifth album. <laughs> uh, I, maybe I get like this extra branch there, and and uh, we actually even underlined the fact with uh, the old logo used on the right. Yeah, the wolf, uh, yeah. the wolf symbolism. So yeah. so those three albums in between there, they are under the different logo. So it's a different timeline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yes. Exactly. So. Um, so I mean, Sad is revered as one of like, the world's most foremost power metal bands, and you know we were you were just talking about that the different stylistic shifts. So you do have uh, you know you draw from a lot of different uh, elements and styles. Um, so with that being said, when you're going into writing a new record, um, is there ever like a conscious decision as to what you want to put into these records? Like you want this to be a little heavy, you want this to be soft, you want three ballads on this or nothing? You know, like. How do you decide which elements goes into uh, um, completing your albums? Um, back in the day, the first albums and all, it was just straightforward. There was no, no question. No, no, I just do what I do, and then just you know, natural. Some of the and then yeah, that was natural movement. But then Unia, that was like an artistic catharsis for me. I just let myself go loose and do whatever I wanted to, you know, experiment and do anything. And that wasn't necessarily business-wise a smart move. <laughs> I don't know, but then. Uh, uh, the following albums, the Days of Grace, I think, was over overall thought as a more cinematography album than than Unia was, and, and but then again, Stone for her name came to be, and, and th that album actually is the one that I've been the least sure of when I've been recording it because I had a lot of demos that I personally thought that hey, this is going to be too soft. But I played the, uh, all the songs to the guys regardless, and, and they loved it. And Hendrik, for example, he was like, "Oh yeah, 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 this is fucking awesome. Yeah. Let's do it." And it's tough yeah. to say no when everybody's yeah, kind of, like, no, everybody's behind okay. it. Yeah, <laughs> fine. Let, let's go in this direction now. And uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I should have been a little bit more boss that everybody thinks I am, and then just you know make it a hard, harder album somehow, more metal or whatever. But instead of that hard rock later nah, now. But maybe but you know, it, it, I think it plays a role and it, it serves a purpose. You know, I learned a lot from making that album, definitely. And uh, it's got us back on the track where we are now, I think. Yeah. I mean, it adds a dynamic to the band and as your, your catalog as a whole, you know, it's you can say like, okay, well, we changed this stuff up. We took some risks and yeah. it's never, you know, can never yeah. say it's a bad decision overall. 
at the time when we released Stone's Quarter Name, I was pretty sure that, hey, this is really great, and we're going to continue in this direction. Now that, you know, after the tour, it was always, okay, no, 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 we need to change something. <laughs> and, uh, we were frankly bored on stage, stiff, you know, yeah. because it was just comfortable. And, and when you come off stage and you're not sweating at all, you're like, oh, dude, this is wrong, because I do. When you're playing this mellow music, it's, it's somehow wrong to <laughs> rave around it on stage and motion and everything. And, and, and it, it started a bit too slow. And also, uh, I don't know, demographic of the audience, what we had there, and, and the, the kind of people who came to see our shows, that also changed. We didn't have any headbangers anymore. If, or if we had, they kind of stood out. But weird headbanger. <laughs> and, uh, and we got this. I don't know, they look like some kind of hipsters standing there. <laughs> and we like this pop music. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of people. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, it was perfect, but it, 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 it was weird. I mean, I mean, I didn't, so, yes, I didn't recognize my audience anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started to miss the people that we had, these headbangers and everything, and it's fun because I, that, that's, we've gotten everything we have from these people and from that kind of music, so I felt like, oh, it's going back home now. <laughs> so so it, it was a conscious decision to uh, go back in, in this more metal style with the right style. Yeah. Give so everybody a little more, yes. a little more aggression, a little more yeah. speed. Yeah. And, uh, but I want to stay kind of slowly and then not go all the way to ecliptic up. Take whatever good we got from uh, uh, Stone's proper name and then bring it also on the album, but make the whole thing harder. You know, because uh, from Stone for Her Name, I learned simplicity. Okay. Yeah. Like kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking, you know, that's just, you know, have melodies. And, and you can actually play those songs with piano or guitar and just sing yeah. the melodies. And then you are not, you don't need to have like a choir of people singing to be able to bring the uh, song to a final and do it live. And uh, I wanted to get away from backing track slavery, you know, <laughs> because we only are five guys on stage and there's no way we can uh, reproduce 50 people without that. We have some songs where I'm singing like 250 tracks. Oh my god, that's just that's insane. But your engineer producers must have loved you when they had the new Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, you guys have like an extensive history, obviously, like you're about nine, nine albums in almost 20 years okay. and now. So, um, do you, oh, hey, Raj. <laughs> um, do you still have the same um, fire and passion for writing and performing as you did before? Because obviously now the dynamic is a little different because when you started off, there was obviously less business involved, and now that it, it is more, uh, I suppose, as a job. Like, you know, musicians do lament and they talk about how the business aspect of it can kind of bog you down and it becomes too much like a job and too much of a chore. So do you still feel like that uh, that fire to create and go out there every night and perform? Yes, of course, when you're on tour and, 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 and to live for that yeah. and miss home. <laughs> you can go back home um, and you spend a month at home, it, it's great and all, but you start to miss the road. You check some other bands' uh, website, and, oh, they are touring there, oh, damn, I want to be there as well. So it's, it, you're always missing the place you're not. Yeah. And after years of seeing these cities over and over and over yeah, again, it's like, yeah, you made, you made, for sure you made friends and know people yeah, all exactly. over the world at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like that. But the fire is still there. But I, I recognize the fact that after I had kids, uh, it, the whole things it changed a little bit. The home became more of a bigger part of the whole yeah. ball. Priorities a little. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, and it changed everything. I'm, I'm not the same person in some way but still i love making music but I, i'd like to do a lot of different stuff as well you know it, there was a period you know when, when the kids were a little bit younger even that i thought oh i'd like to make children's music and i'm like <laughs> your face suck and face dude we're not going there Go I, I've written, yeah i've written like one or two songs that would be considered a kid's music like <laughs> for children but you know uh, this they are totally and this is totally incorrect to say but Rapeable. <laughs> Those songs you get them to <laughs> take a break sheet out of them and then make them like some of Arctic songs. So they are basically good songs. But they are like la 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 la. <laughs> that stuff. It's just 
and rid them, <laughs> you know, of all the flesh off and, and bones and build metal song out of them. <laughs> so, so <Sorry>. many BPM. <laughs> Add some double bass to it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's, that's uh, how it's done sometimes, yeah. you know. You might get a really good song when you just start playing with children's keyboard thing and ding 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 ding, ding. Oh, this is a nice song and now all of a sudden you just take it to a different environment. Yeah. This kid's song and <laughs> 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 like my kids like yeah. maybe maybe a mid twenty year old would like this too. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um so I mean speaking about creative process, uh like how far along are you right now with uh, the the next release? Uh, are there any details that you can give us about that at this point? To be totally honest, I should be Further along, okay. I have like maybe four or five songs that I consider being somewhere that I've actually played to the guys already, <laughs> and we should be uh, starting the rehearsals for the album right after we come home from this tour, which, okay. which is like early April. Um, the album should be ready uh, uh, at the end of June, so it, it's going to be tight. It's going to be really okay. stressful. But, uh, I brought my Riding gear here, which is, uh, I know it's a no go from the start. <laughs> no go from the get go. And, uh, <laughs> it's really hard to concentrate on, on riding, creating something new uh, in tour environment. You know, yeah. there's a lot to distract. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and even if you manage to get yourself caught somewhere, you want to go somewhere, you know, and, and, and see the city or whatever, and uh, yeah. check out what everybody's doing. And that's what you do on tour. It's just like yeah, you're just running around. The regular tour ebb and flow. There's always yeah. a bar or something yeah, that's exactly. around. People yeah. see in interviews that do like this. So. Yeah, exactly. So, but still, I, I, I hope I try to get over that, all the hassle, and then write at least one or two songs. It's uh, you know easier when I go home and, and I actually manage to get something other than touring done as yeah. well. It's a little easier to focus on. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A little less of the external yeah. distractions going yeah. on. Or then again, you know, if I don't get any any, any new material written on the road, I hope I get enough uh, inspiration from this. Uh, like so more fire. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm not sure I will actually. Yeah, it's going to be like that. We're totally full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> no, 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 I'm going to do this album right Yeah. So you guys are about like uh, this is your third or fourth show into the tour right now. Yeah, third, third, yeah, third yeah. show. So like uh, you know, the first couple of shows have been sold out. This one's sold out. Other ones are selling out. Uh, I mean, how have the the North American Night Wish fans have been uh, receiving you guys so far? And this must be one of your biggest, bigger, biggest North American tours to date at this point. Uh, yeah, it's been really great for us. You know, but so we somehow uh, um, share the fans yeah. in some level. But of course, this is. A worthwhile tour for us, mostly because Nightwish has so much more fans than we have. There are a lot of people in every night that I haven't even heard of us. They know Nightwish, of course, but I don't listen to some of the Arctic Island, and, and maybe they've heard the name or somewhere too, but we have a chance of wowing them, you know. Do you get that yes. often, like people coming up to you and going, Oh, I maybe I've heard the name, but I haven't quite, I've never heard the music yes. before? Yes, yesterday, the last time. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, uh, does that feel good? Feel like of that. course, you know, because this is exactly what we are doing here. We'll be back later this year and have a headlining tour. Okay, great. Coming, so, yeah, it's a, that's the time to harvest and see <laughs> if, it, if this actually did any good. Yeah, yeah. See who comes back and willing to see the full yeah, set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We try to, try to get North America up again. Yeah. Because I remember we played here in Montreal some really big shows <laughs> in the past, about like 10 years ago. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I didn't appreciate it clearly. Way you know, like even nearly enough back in the day, but you know, dang. Well, we've sold out this venue as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm talking about that. Um, I mean, you've been around. Uh, you guys have been touring for quite a long time, and you've been able to see a lot of trends come and go within the international music community, the music community in North America and Europe and whatnot. Um, like, is there anything that sticks out in your mind, like some more poignant changes that you've seen over the course of, let's say, 10 or 15 years, like maybe the demo, you know, we kind of touched on this a little earlier, but you said like, you know, like the, demo the general demographic and the size, uh, you know, like even, you, you even mentioned like the dress of people coming out, like how has that shifted over the last couple of years? Is it, uh, I mean, you did mention that, you know, when on one record, like you saw more of a certain type of people come out. So do you think that's a symptom of the, let's say the over the scene in general, or, you know, the kind of fans that let's say your music, whatever record you're on is kind of bringing up? Um, 
if I use Finland as an example, it used to be a metal bands that were headlining all the festivals. Any festival you had a, you had a metal band playing there, and then it was on TV, hockey matches, and everything, and then. And uh, it was metal music and, and TV shows, metal music playing there and everything. And now it's hip hop, and you have like hip hop artists selling uh, stadiums and shit. So <laughs> that has changed. So I mean, you can you can tell. I don't know how much it has got to do with the fact that there are now a lot of streaming services and everything, and the album sales are plummeting because of that. Mostly, why would you go and buy an album if you can just hear it for free, free? thinking that they are getting paid from each? rotation in the bands, but they, they, it, is, it is not nowhere near the same, nowhere near. Do you so, feel maybe people aren't valuing the music the same way they did? As prior, when you have to actually you know, invest they, your money in. They, there's a generation of people growing at the moment who do not value music the way they should, really, unfortunately. So I hope that that's going to change. But, you know, I, I've said it before that it, we are in the middle of, uh, how do you say it? Drop-in game, you know, only the strong survive, right. and if you're willing to put in enough effort to it, and, and only the relevant, relevant people and the bands remain. And a lot of bands that are, if they are not making enough money, for example, by touring and, and by selling albums, uh, the unfortunate fact is that everybody needs to eat food and pay rent and mortgage, whatever, and, and you have money. Be, yeah, like live life. And you need money for that, and, and you need to take a day job. And all the time you spend out you know, doing something else is away from music, yeah. unfortunately. And especially from touring, who's going to hire a dude who's going to be away half a year? Yeah, that's, that's the problem. So yeah, the unfortunate reality of yes. If you have children, it's yeah. not even the matter of yourself, but you need to take care of the kids yeah. and feed them. So, um, so, I mean, obviously, like, touring is a huge component to, I mean, this, this industry, you know, when, uh, especially when it comes to being relevant and uh, maintaining and gaining popularity. So, um, I mean, is there kind of, uh, you find yourself uh, strategizing almost at the beginning of an album cycle, what kind of tools do you want to do in the sense of like, okay, well, we'll do maybe two support tours this year and then we'll do one headliner here or we want to try to get that tour. Like, is there... Uh, yeah, is there a strategy? Do you have a clear goal as to what kind of tours and let's say even who you want to go out with? I mean, obviously, yeah, a band like Nightwish, who yeah. wouldn't want to. But yeah, we are under the same management also, yeah. so that's kind of easy marriage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I don't know, our manager would be the right guy to answer this one. You know, we usually we can go and headline basically anywhere. Yeah. So, uh, that's an unfortunate thing about it because, you know, of course, they can be way more lucrative. Financially, the headlining tour, despite you are playing in front of bigger audiences and whatever, but this is this is advertisement. That's it. I mean, like you said before, like you get in front of uh, somebody else's crowd, yeah. and you see, you try to you see if you reap the rewards in the, uh, the headlining. Uh, like the, like actually, like Nightwish, the previous tour they had here, and it was a big one. And that was the first one they actually got some money out of from North really? America. Yes, that's the fact, and we've gone home with huge. Invoice one time, <laughs> for example. <laughs> so it's it's just for us. It's we enjoy touring North America. Yeah. That's that's the thing. We love playing here. It's fantastic. So I, it's it's uh, you know battling the zero and trying to make a small zero as possible. Yeah. <laughs> In a way, so uh, uh, you're keeping the American dream alive. <laughs> you know, if you make it big here, then you'll be making big. Uh, you're fighting the good fight. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then uh, for metal music and. and you know, making it here it opens a lot of doors elsewhere because it's, it's got the uh, advertisement potential. It's, it's, it's funny because I find that in, uh, in North America, especially with uh, bands like melodic metal, melodic death metal, uh, power metal, and whatnot, especially in Montreal, because Montreal for uh, like forever, I mean, we were, we were like the power metal capital of North America. But it's like, but as somebody on the inside, you know, like we saw, you know, like when, you know, when you guys were headlining medley and uh, the first times at like Halloween and all that, uh, Rapsy would come over and you know sell these places out. We always dreamt that Europe was the place that you need to make it, you know. So it's kind of a weird inverse from uh, from different uh, different sides of the spectrum. Yeah. You know, we were always like, no, you gotta make it in Europe, like <laughs> fuck North America. Like, yeah. So it's like, <laughs> you know, maybe not necessarily that, but like the importance was always over there because that's where all you guys are coming from. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Making it in Finland doesn't mean anything. 
Hold up, hold up. And again, you know, you're gonna break a you lot know. of hearts if you tell me. <laughs> 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 but, you know, then, again, then we, we didn't grow in Finland to be anything until there was a lot of news that these guys are really big in Japan. <laughs> so, so it's all of a yeah, in Finland, was, they woke up and, hey, this is Southern Arctic, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. check them out, they are big in Japan. Okay, so um, and we were talking about touring and uh, obviously the lifestyle is really draining on, uh, on, on bands that go out and tour for extensive amount of times. Uh, you know, and that often results in people, you know, band, band members changing and burning out. How do you stay uh, focused and centered, whether uh, on the road or, or back home? Well, um, on a tour, it's getting easier and easier in a way, despite the fact that you have kids, all of us, and, and, and most of us have to have in South Arctic, actually. So, um, um, because of internet, which is weird, because we're suffering from the other effects of internet, you know, downloading and all that. But, but still, again, you know, the um, um, interaction between you, know, so you and your family, it's so much easier. You have Skype and, and equal and things and you know, such things, and, and uh, when you go home, your know, kids know who you are. <laughs> it is really nice. There are like examples of that not being the case. Dad, well, there's a, some dude at the door <laughs> who says he's dad. <laughs> you have that solid support structure at home. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, an yeah, easy one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, home is the place where everything starts from, basically. If you have problems there, you have problems on the road. All right, well, I knew we'll wrap this up. It'll be my last question. <laughs> um, I mean, I've been coming and seeing you guys play for about 10 years, maybe more than that. Um, and I'd like to think that, uh, like, we, you know, I feel that Montreal's been a huge supporter of uh, Sonata over the years. And I hope that uh, Montreal's got a soft spot, it's got a nice place in the... Absolutely. In a, in a place of Sonata. Uh, um, is there any uh, specific story about either Montreal or Quebec in general that uh, that you remember off the top of your head? Like, like I don't know, a show or some, some story, some anecdote? Well, uh, the first tour when we came here, um, that was, must have been 2006, actually, or against the year, something like that. Uh, that was an amazing experience. We only had this tiny, tiny tour on the East Coast, and, and then we had two shows, in, in, uh, one, one in uh, Montreal and one in Quebec, I think, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Sorry. And uh, those were the ones that were clearly the biggest, and also on the following tours that took the whole North America. Uh, and we knew that these would be the best shows and the rest would be just like, okay, nice, nice, nice. But these are the big shows. <laughs> so uh, definitely, you know, uh, Canada, and especially the French-speaking Canada, yeah. uh, that it, it felt like France. It was like the good thing we have. France. That, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and, and all the good, good things from France. The fact that we had a really great following in France, and maybe, you, of course, it was easy for you to follow the French um, uh, papers and everything that had like stories of us and all that. So it, 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 it was like extension of all the good things in front. <laughs> and and I, I was so happy. And we were always really happy to come here and still of course are. Yeah. You know, these are the best shows on North America. Yeah. Well we're happy you're still coming back and Absolutely. entertaining us year after year. Yeah, I hope so you very much later this year I hope we'll come back. You know when about uh, do you know what about the next tour is gonna be? Um, yeah, late this year, before Little Christmas, right before Christmas, but I don't have the places yet. I don't know okay. if we actually come hopefully here in Montreal as well. All right, man. We'll be looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.